This digilesson will review the types of scalp hematomas that occur in neonates. A review of the anatomy of the scalp will be followed by a review of the three common types of scalp hematomas. The five layers of the scalp are easy to remember using the mnemonic scalp. The first layer is the skin. The second layer is connective tissue. This layer of connective tissue is dense and it is closely adherent to the skin above and the epicranial aponeurosis below. Essentially, these three layers function as one. The blood vessels and nerves of the scalp are present in the dense connective tissue layer. The third layer is the epicranial aponeurosis. This is a tendinous sheath that is connected to the frontalis muscle in front and the occipitalis muscle in the nape of the neck, and it also extends from year to year. While it is firmly adherent to the two layers above, it slides easily on the two layers below. The fourth layer is loose connective tissue. The emissary veins that drain into the superior sagittal sinus are present in this layer. The fifth layer is the pericranium. This is basically the periosteum of the skull bone surrounding the whole skull bone and is loosely attached to the surface of the skull bone while it is very firmly adherent at the suture lines. The diploic veins drain blood from the skull bones into the superior sagittal sinus. And finally, we have the brain. Armed with the knowledge of scalp anatomy, it should be easy for you to understand the three different types of scalp hematomas that occur in neonates. These include the caput succedaneum, the cephalohematoma, and the subgaleal hematoma. The way to remember the characteristics of a caput is to visualize a baby wearing a cap. Note, a cap covers all the suture lines and crosses suture lines. In the same way, a caput looks like a cap and it crosses suture lines. A caput is caused by mechanical trauma of the presenting part of the scalp as it pushes through the narrow cervix. There is usually some associated skin bruising that may make a caput look like a hematoma, but it is not a hematoma. It is a swelling related to traumatic edema of the second layer of the scalp or the dense connective tissue. The fluid is serosanguinous. And if you press down on it, it causes pitting edema. It is present at birth and it resolves within 12 to 18 hours. Blood loss is minimal, about 10 to 15 ml at max. And there are no associated complications. A cephalohematoma occurs below the fifth layer of the scalp the pericranium. As noted before, the pericranium is loosely adherent above the bone, however is firmly attached at the suture lines. This limits the spread of blood across the suture line and so limits the size of the cephalohematoma. However, since the parietal plate is very large, they can still be significant blood loss from a cephalohematoma. Note the cephalohematoma in this baby. Very clearly demarcated and not crossing the suture line. Just like in caput succedaneum, a cephalohematoma also occurs because of a prolonged second stage of labor or vacuum extraction causing significant pressure and traction over the 
periosteum, leading to disruption of the diploic blood vessels and development of the hematoma. Unlike the caput, this is not benign. Since it is deeper than the caput, it is not noted at birth. It is usually noted two to three days after delivery. It is typically present on the parietal scalp. And because of the texture of the pericranium, it feels like a ping pong ball. It takes two to three weeks to heal and heals from the outside inwards. And it can sometimes get calcified. There can easily be 20 to 50 ml of blood loss, which accounts for nearly 10 to 20 percent of total blood volume, which is extremely significant. Complications include anemia and hyperbilirubinemia, underlying skull fracture, and finally, bacterial seeding of the hematoma that can lead to osteomyelitis as well as meningitis, as the diploic veins serve as a conduit for infection passing into the brain and into the bone. And finally, let's talk about subgaleal hematomas. These are a diffuse subcutaneous hematoma that occurs below the third layer, the epicranial aponeurosis, and above the pericranium. This space is huge, and the potential for exsanguinating into this place is huge. Anatomically, the space extends from above the frontal bone, down to the occipital bone, and from one ear to the other ear on the other side. Blood can fill in to this whole space. And a child could essentially exsanguinate into this potential space once the bleeding starts. Also note kind of the year-to-year -year spread. The cause is the same as the other two hematomas a difficult vacuum-assisted delivery, or a prolonged second stage of labor, specifically in the occipital posterior position. A subgaleal hematoma can be catastrophic. The good news is that it is rare, occurring in 4 to 25 per 10,000 live births. Although present at birth, it is not initially noticed because it is so diffuse. It usually presents around 3 days to 1 week. An infant can essentially exsanguinate into the skull, losing their full blood volume in a matter of days. This can lead to serious hemorrhagic shock, coagulopathies, anemia jaundice, skull fracture, and intracranial bleed. These neonates will require aggressive resuscitation, and if the diagnosis is missed, they can die. In closing, when you see a neonate with a scalp hematoma, you need to get a good birth history. Specifically, whether this was a difficult delivery, a vacuum extraction, or a prolonged second stage of labor. It is important to know when the hematoma was first noted. If it was noted at birth and is getting smaller, it is probably a caput succedaneum. If it was noted at birth and is getting larger, it's probably a subgaleal hematoma. If it was not present at birth and is now noted at two or three days of life, it is probably a cephalohematoma. If there is a large hematoma, always worry about an underlying skull fracture. Finally, if the child looks unstable and sick, consider a subgaleal hematoma. These neonates will require aggressive resuscitation for hemorrhagic shock to include your ABCs, IV access, type and cross match, CBC, coagulopathy screen, a total indirect bilirubin, electrolytes, skull x-ray, and potentially a CT scan of the head. I hope you learned something today, specifically that subgaleal hematomas are bad news 
and should be picked up early and treated aggressively. Thank you.